Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. If you lack wisdom when you're in the trial, when you're in the trouble, when you're being tempted and you don't know what to do and it seems like you scan the horizon and your little ship is nowhere to be seen, ask God for wisdom. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hi there, I'm Bayless Conley, and I am glad you are with me. You know, one of the things that I have come to love about the Bible is that it gives us the unvarnished truth. God tells people stories, and He tells about their mistakes and their sins, as well as their triumphs. And we're going to be getting into the book of James, and it actually begins by talking about some of the pitfalls of life. I think you're going to get something out of it, so please stay tuned. Evening, everybody. Welcome to the first night of a series we're going to be doing on Wednesdays for a little while. Um, I won't say it's my favorite book in the Bible because that actually happens to me all the time. Almost with any book I'm reading becomes my contemporary favorite. But I will say this. I have probably read the book of James more than any other book in the Bible. For some reason, in the last 40 years, I've been drawn to it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And like all of the Word of God, it's pregnant. It's always given birth to new, you know, facets of revelation and, and just showing you something different. And so I'm, I'm excited that we're starting this series tonight. And uh, I've been given the first chapter, the... Um, Truth is, I, I've taught on the whole book of James before, and I think it took me an hour just to get through verse one. <laughs> you ready? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your eternal word, and we just ask you to give us illumination through the Holy Spirit tonight. Um, that which is appropriate and proper for each of us in this season of our lives, cause us to get it, O oh God, in order that your Son might be glorified, that we might be conformed to his image, and that the work of your house may go forward. We ask it in his precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Right, open your Bibles, please, to James chapter 1. The title of my message is James chapter 1. Let's talk about pitfalls. Verse 1, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which were scattered abroad, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And notice he said when you fall into various trials, not if you fall into various trials. Trials, here the, the Greek word means troubles, temptations, trials. He said, count it all joy. Throw a party when you get in trouble. <laughs> count it all joy when you're going through a trial. Count it all joy when you're, you're beset with temptations and troubles on every side. In fact, the, the, the phrase there, when you fall, in, in the original language, it says, to, it literally means to fall into something that is constantly all around you. It will happen. When you fall, he said, count it all joy. Now, that is not just a doctrine of be happy no matter what. You know, you, you, you're, your baby's sick, be happy. You know, your, your, your boy's in prison, be happy. He had a car accident, be happy. Now, that's a stupid doctrine. And that's actually not this, what, that, what this is saying. It says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Verse 3, knowing. Everyone say knowing. knowing. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Amen. Now, if you don't know, verse 3, and if you don't do, verse 4, 
Counting it all joy makes no sense. Count it all joy knowing, and then he tells you what you need to know, and then doing, he tells you what you need to do, and it makes perfect sense when we know and when we do, but it doesn't make sense if we don't. Listen to those same verses, verse 3 and 4 from the New Living Translation. It says, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, as we count it all joy and we don't let go of our trust, both an inward and an outward work is being done for us. The inward work, I think pe people understand, is pretty obvious. I mean, patience is developed. Strength is developed. Stewardship may be developed. Resilience, character, all those things are developed. Our ability grows when it comes to encouraging others that are suffering or going through a rough patch. When you've been through it, when you've stood the test and you found out that, that God is faithful, well, you see someone else that's going through it, suddenly there's this capacity in you to lift them up and to encourage their heart. So there, there's some wonderful inward things that can be worked when we're going through troubles, but there's also an outward work. Notice in verse 3 it said that the testing of your faith, it's our faith that is under fire. Now, faith is the hand that reaches out and receives what God offers to us freely through his grace. Be that salvation or any other thing that God provides, it all comes to us by his grace. Faith is the hand that reaches out to receive what God offers by grace. Grace is the reservoir of everything we need in this life and everything we need in our walk with Christ. And faith is the hand that lays hold of that. Consider Mark chapter 5. We have the story of a woman that was lacking health for 12 years. It's something that God's grace through Jesus provides is healing and health. She was made perfect and complete, no longer lacking health. How did it happen? Jesus looked at her and says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, it says, Noah experienced the rescue and salvation of his family through faith. Sarah went from being barren to being able to conceive through faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 11, enemies were defeated, barriers were broken, material needs were supplied all through faith. Even a relationship with God was deepened and expanded through faith because the scripture says in Hebrews 11 and 5 that by faith Enoch walked with God. I want you to listen to me. In each area there was a distinct lack can be a lack of health, a lack of resources, a lack of peace, a lack of, of, you know, understanding this whole relationship with God, presence of God thing. There's this area I've got this great, you know, capacity for growth in my relationship with God. There may be a lack in, in you know, uh, good family relationships. There, there's a lack. And faith in each of those cases in Hebrews 11 gained access into God's grace to fill that lack. And the individual cited they continued in faith until the answer came. And the answer, at least here in part, or the idea rather in part, is don't quit. Don't quit. Let patience, let endurance have its complete and perfect work so that you can be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Inwardly, yes. I don't want to be lacking in character. I don't want to be lacking in discipline. I don't want to be lacking in patience. I don't want to be lacking in, in all of those things so that I can be perfect and entire, wanting nothing on the inside but on the outside. You know, I'm trusting God for these things, and if His grace is providing it, if I don't quit, it can bring me to this place of being lacking nothing. How many of you follow me so far? Now, if hand is the... If your, your hand represents faith that reaches out and receives what God provides through His grace, then your arm represents your endurance or your patience. 
You see, endurance or patience keeps faith applied until the answer comes. But if I take my arm down, what comes down with it? My faith. I'm trusting God, but we grow impatient. I think so many times we don't see answers to our prayers. We, we don't see that lack filled up because of a lack of endurance, because we quit too early. Why is there a delay in getting answers to our prayers so many times? One reason, and there are many, but one reason is because we have an enemy. The scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Think about Daniel. He had actually read something in the scripture about Messiah being cut off. He set his heart to seek God and began to ask God for an answer. 21 days later, an angel shows up with the answer. He says, Daniel, you're highly favored of God. And from the first day you set your heart to seek God, I was dispatched with the answer. What does it take an angel 21 days to fly from heaven to earth? From the moment you, you, you made your request, Daniel, I was sent from heaven with the answer. What have you been doing 21 days, Mr. Angel? And the angel says, well, actually, and this is slightly paraphrased, but you can read it. It says, I met resistance from the forces of darkness, and they hindered me, and God had to dispatch Michael, a warring angel, to break a way through so that I could get here with the answer. There was spiritual warfare going on that Daniel knew nothing about. What if he had quit on the 20th day? What if he'd given up on day 16? He says, this is stupid. Nothing's happening. Nothing's changing. I'm not hearing anything. I'm not seeing anything. No, he endured. He kept trusting, believing that God had heard his request. And 21 days later... The answer came, and the scripture says the reason was because of interference from the enemy of our soul, the devil. Now, you know, sometimes God's answers are instant, and we all love that. And I like it when God acts quickly. I like it when God dances to my tune. I like it when, when I don't have to wait, and th this is the... You know, the answers to prayers come immediately. And sometimes God does immediate things. One time Jesus got in a boat with the disciples. There was a storm going on. The Bible says immediately they were at the shore where they were going. This instantaneous thing happened. Man, I like that. But I also read in, in the book of Acts, Paul was in this great storm with a whole bunch of people on a boat. And they didn't see the light of the sun, the stars, and the moon for many days. Actually, weeks upon weeks, they were being tossed around like a cork in a typhoon. All hope they should be saved was finally given up and an angel intervened. There was supernatural deliverance that occurred, but it was a process and they ended up losing the ship and having to float to shore on, you know, broken pieces of the ship. Now, both of them, there was a supernatural element. In both of those instances, there was divine intervention but if I'm honest, I'd say, God, I want to be in the story that the boat's immediately at the shore. I don't want to be in the, the, you know, the process and the whole storm that went on. Some of you here tonight, you know, you've experienced being at the shore immediately. Others, you're like that cork bobbing around in the storm right now. And it's a process with you. But listen, our God is faithful. And regardless of whether it's the, the quick thing or the process thing, you're going to be okay. He is faithful. He's faithful. And most of you know, January 2014, I was in a serious boating accident. Um, they, uh, you know, worked on me in surgery. There's a whole lot of moving parts to the story, but they, the first thing the lead surgeon said when, when they came out of surgery with me, she said to Janet, and they've been working on me for hours and hours, said every one of us thought we were going to lose him. We didn't think he'd be able to live. And uh, there was such severe trauma to my, my throat was crushed and torn open. I was bleeding on the brain. 
had an artery that sprung a leak. My carotid artery had a big flap in it. I had a dead vocal cord because of all the, the trauma to my throat, just, et cetera, et cetera. A bunch of stuff going on. And uh, so I'm in the hospital for a long time. Eventually get out of the hospital. I have no ability to swallow. I didn't have a sip of water for months. I couldn't because I had no ability to swallow. I would choke. And, uh, you know, everything I ate or drank was through a tube in my stomach. And uh, I, my tongue didn't work. Nothing worked anymore. So I, you know, I would communicate, but most people couldn't understand what I was saying. And uh, I had to learn how to speak all over again. And, and quite honestly, even now, I have to form certain words a different way than I used to because the acoustics are so different inside. I don't have to think about it now, it's second nature, but I, I worked hard, worked hard, hard, hard every day for months and months and months to learn to say words and to make sounds because I couldn't make them the way that I made. And eventually my, you know, dead vocal cord woke up and, you know, through a process, and that's the key word, through the process. I can, you know, I don't think my voice is as strong as it used to be, but I can get the ball over the net. You, you guys are being able to make out what I say, right? You know, people would say to me, people would say to me, Pastor, you sound great. We can't tell any difference. And I'd be thinking, you're such a fat liar. <laughs> and the only person that was ever honest with me was my grandson, Sawyer. He said, Papa, you sound so weird. <laughs> When are you going to start talking normal again? I said, I'm working on it, boy. I'm working on it. And listen, I realize, believe me, I realize, I'm acutely aware that the main reason that I stand here today and I can eat anything I want, I can drink anything I want, I can actually, and this took me a long time, it took me probably a year before I could actually carry on a conversation and eat at the same time because I couldn't do that. I'd choke. It was just, just too much. But I, I'm, I'm here because of, A, the grace of God, and B, the prayers of the saints, because a lot of people prayed for me. I wouldn't be here if not for that. But as well, and this is the smaller part, big part, God's grace, prayers of people, small part right here. But when I was able to, and I wasn't able to for quite a long time, but once I was able to, I began to feed on the Word of God every day and soak in healing scriptures. I reread F.F. F. Bosworth's Christ the Healer, best little book on healing I've ever found. And every day, I just did my best to keep my faith engaged and to trust God through that process. I did my best to do my part and to just trust and to stay in the Word. And it was probably, I don't know, six months into it, and I'm still sounding like Donald Duck and it's so hard to swallow and to drink and, and I had a dream and in the dream you know there was my my funny voice and all of a sudden something shifted and my voice started sounding normal in the dream and I woke up and I knew I was going to get over the hump but it, we need to keep our faith and that, that's my point in all this we need to keep our faith applied let patience have its perfect work in other words let it go to maturity Keep, keep, be patient. Keep your faith applied until all the inward work is done in you that God wants to do, until the outward work happens as well. Because most of the time, our God is a God of process. No less miraculous. It just doesn't happen as quickly as we like it to. And I know some people are thinking, well, no, Pastor, I've stood and I've stood and I've stood and I've stood and I've stood. And either A... It seems like just God didn't hear me or is not listening to me, or B, I must be missing something. Well, that may be the case. And the thing you may be missing is wisdom. Look with me at the very next verse, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. In the context of being in the midst 
of trials where you are having to exercise faith and patience, where you're having to patiently endure and continue to trust when it doesn't seem like things are changing. In that context, he said, if you lack wisdom, ask God, and he will tell you what you need to know. You don't know what to do, God will tell you. But he said, you have to ask him in faith. You have to be confident that God, you said you'd do this. I believe you've heard me, and I'm going to thank you for it. I don't see my way out yet, but I believe you've heard my prayer, and I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. Ask in faith, nothing wavering. It'll be given liberally, and God's not going to stand back and say, I can't believe you don't know this. How long have you been going to church? How long have you been reading your Bible? He won't find fault with us. And sometimes wisdom, which the Scripture says is the principal thing, is that missing ingredient. Faith isn't the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. So as we exercise faith and patience, Sometimes we need to ask God for wisdom. And God will show us what to do by His Spirit through His Word. In fact, look a little later in the chapter, verses 22 to 25. But be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he's like a man, observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So I've asked God for wisdom. I need to listen prayerfully when I'm on my knees and I need to search the word because God will speak to me through the word. And when he speaks to me, I I need to do it. I have a friend, he's actually been in heaven quite a few years now, but he was an old time, sort of a faith guy, you know, preacher, and he was an old man when I met him, and um, just a brilliant Bible teacher, humble man, and shared the story with me once, he was ministering overseas in a country, and it was exceedingly hot there, really, really hot, really, really humid, he was not used to it, and uh, he'd been ministering for a couple of days, and he took ill, and he said, I got violently sick, says, I was nauseous, I had a screaming headache, I was weak, I had no strength, and I realized this was serious, and the symptoms were getting worse and worse. I prayed, he said, people prayed for me, they they had some, you know, people there look at me, and they're in a bit of an isolated region, and he says, it was getting worse and worse, the headache's getting worse, the symptoms are getting worse, I'm more and more nauseated, I'm weaker and weaker, I'm, I'm, I'm dizzy, I I can't stand up. He said, I asked God for wisdom because I wasn't getting an answer to my prayers and it's getting worse and worse. He says, God, give me wisdom. God said, if you ask wisdom, he'll tell you. He'll give it to you. And he said, the Holy Spirit said to me, eat salt. He thought, what? But he did. Went and ate a bunch of salt. And within a short period of time, all those alarming symptoms abated and eventually got back to normal and then, you know, talked to a doctor later on. And all of those things were symptoms of the fact that he had sweated so profusely, it sweated all the salt out of his body and actually did get into a dangerous area. If you lack wisdom, ask. Or I heard of a guy that was sort of having World War III with one of his neighbors. Um, They didn't get along. Sometimes, I mean, the neighbor yelled at his kids that really got under his skin and just like there was this constant fighting. But this one guy's a Christian and he knows it's not right. But this has been going on a year, conflict with the neighbor next door. And so finally, he says, God, please give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. He prayed and prayed and not gotten, you know, an answer. Things hadn't changed. They just escalated and gotten worse and worse. And so he said, God, you've got to give me wisdom. Show me what to do. And he was reading in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus said these words, bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Love your enemies. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him, seemed to jump off the page. 
And he's like, God, you're not saying what I think you're saying. <laughs> and then he had this thought that came up almost simultaneously, bake your neighbor a peach pie. <laughs> so I thought, what can I lose? He baked a peach pie, went over, knocked on the door, has got this hot pie in his hand. Neighbor answers the door, says, steps back, says, what do you want? He says, man, I, I know we haven't been friendly. I just want you to know I'm sorry. And I just brought you a peach pie as a bit of a peace offering. Guy said, peach? He says, yeah. He said, that's my favorite. <laughs> he said, come on in. Went out and he cut two slices of pie, put some coffee on, and they, they actually buried the hatchet. And from that day, things changed and they became friends. But it was wisdom. If you lack wisdom, when you're in the trial, when you're in the trouble, when you're being tempted and you don't know what to do and it seems like you scan the horizon and your little ship is nowhere to be seen, ask God for wisdom. Some of you, listen, I'm telling you, it's what you need to do before you lay your head on the pillow tonight. And God will answer you. He will show you what you need to do. And if you will do what he says, your problem is solved, whether you can understand it or not. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. They listen, and they obey. I think that kind of encapsulates the, the totality of our responsibility as believers. We listen and obey. But pastor, I got marriage problems. Okay, hear and follow. But, but I got financial problems. I got the answer. Listen and obey. But, but I don't know, my kids are driving me crazy. Listen and obey. My sheep hear and they follow. James said, if you ask, God will give it to you. He will give you the wisdom you need. And if you do it, you'll be blessed in the deed, even as we're... Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. Bayless will continue with part two of his message next week. Well, I hope that you got something out of it. You're going to need to join us next time as we continue this message. But let me tell you this. It's not a coincidence that you're watching me right, right now. God is interested in every detail of your life. He's interested in meeting your needs. Why not take a moment and just ask the Father, to, to supply what it is you need and see if he doesn't work in a miraculous, maybe even a surprising way. When your strength is failing, God will carry you through. Do you need to be lifted up? Go online today and find Bayless's Taking Hold of God's Strength Study Guide. It is our free gift to you. In it, Bayless will guide you through four steps that are crucial to understanding God's strength for you and how to overcome your weakness with God on your side. Request your free PDF download of this encouraging study guide at baylessconley.tv strength. God has strength and an answer for you. We're grateful for the friends and partners of Answers with Bayless Conley who helped make this program possible.